This is Masters in Business with Barry Ritholtz on Bloomberg Radio. This week on the podcast, Michael Lewis out with a brand new book on Sam Bankman-Fried and FTX doing the circuit. We managed to get him right after his 60 Minutes podcast, and he was completely open and unguarded and talked about everything, talked about the process of writing the book, what it's like to go on uh, 60 Minutes and know that uh, social media is going to come at you. People would much rather go to the outrage machine than actually learn the details and argue from a factual perspective. He doesn't have an opinion on whether or not Sam Bankman-Fried is going to be found guilty or not. And the book is similar. He just lays it out as he saw it as a fly on the wall and lets you, the reader, figure it out. So all of you um, haters out there, he's just shaking it off and moving on with whatever is going to be his next book project. I found the book to be absolutely fascinating. Really enjoyed it, although I, I read it you know quickly in a weekend. Normally I luxuriate in Michael Lewis, and I found our conversation to be completely delightful, and I think you will also. So with no further ado, my discussion on Going Infinite with Michael Lewis. It's good to see you, Barry. Good to see you again. So let's start out talking about how this landed in your lap. A friend is thinking about doing a deal with FTX, and he contacts you, says, I can't get a read on this guy, Sam Bankman-Fried. Tell us about that first meeting with SBF. What was that like? So this friend reaches out in September of 2021, uh, and I'd never heard of Sam Bankman-Fried or FTX. Uh, I hadn't been paying much attention to crypto. Um, and Sam Bankman-Fried, a few weeks later, ends up on my front porch, and I take him for a, a hike in the hills of Berkeley. He's, I think it's the first hike he ever went on. Uh, right. He was always dressed for the hike, but never actually goes Sneakers, on. cargo shorts, yeah, T-shirt. I, I, I had no idea what was going to turn up. And what turned up was this kind of kid. He's 29 years old. So I wasn't thinking this is literary material. I was thinking my friend wants to know what I think of this guy. Um, but an hour into the walk, after I've discovered that Forbes has decided he's worth $22.5 billion, he's kind of bemused by his whole situation. It's, all, it's gone from zero, this has happened in 18 months. He's gone from zero to 22 and a half billion in 18 months. And he's describing what is going on in crypto, where he intends to use this money, uh, kind of his background, where he came from. There's this child of these two Stanford academics. His parents were just completely bewildered by what had happened to their child because they weren't, like they weren't money people. They weren't materialistic people. They, they were people who just kind of lived in their heads. And he said, they don't quite understand what to make of all this. And I thought it was kind of, funny. So I called my friend at the end of it. I said, go ahead, do the deal. What could go wrong? And he did the deal. But I, I turned to Sam Bankman-Fried at the end of it. And I said, um, I don't know where this is going to end, but I just want to watch. Can I just tag along? He, like that first meeting, you actually set this up. And in he fact, was I, that fascinating. He was that fascinating. And, and I know this because I, I gave some interview right after this. And someone said, do you know what your next book project might be? And I said, you know, I just had a two-hour walk with a guy, and I think I might have found it. Uh, but I didn't know what the book was. I didn't know much more about him than you can learn in two hours. I just knew I had this, I had a theory of, I had a theory about how I wanted my next book to work before COVID. I don't want to bore you with this, but before COVID, I had made a decision that I wanted to walk into books with characters that I was going to, I wasn't going to know what the story was. I wasn't going to have a theory of the case. I wasn't going to have an argument. I was going to attach myself to characters interest, who interested me. As opposed to prior as a, as books a, as a, as a, well, where there's a narrative and the characters flesh out, flesh it out. Well, you're inverting it. in the kind of, I, I'd always kind of done this. I was just making a bigger point of it. And my prior books that I felt that were less fun to write were books where I had to strain to make the characters characters, like to make them live on the page. Because really? Because uh, I find all your characters leap off the page. Or, or maybe that's just uh, it's there. I think I think that there is a weakness, for example, to Flash Boys in the character of Brad Katsuyama because he's well, that's because he's a chill exactly, dude. Exactly. Precisely. You know, he's a laid back. He's guy. a simply nice, decent guy. Right. That he's very. I love him. 
but but he's, but he's doing something really so it different. it works only because when you drop that character into the middle of modern Wall Street, it gets right. very interesting. He's very Canadian. He's very Canadian, right? right? And that doesn't come nice across. Canadian guy right. is not where I wanted to ever start again, <laughs> and uh, I wanted to start with complicated, interesting people, and I had an idea. Uh, my idea was Mike Leach, coach of the uh, Mississippi State Bulldogs at the time, mm-hmm. was going to let me move into his life for a season in the S- in SEC football. And that could have been fun. And, th- I, and I, so it's character and situation. College football is in turmoil because of the name, image, and likeness stuff. The, the, the transfer portal. It, yeah. it, it, it's and the SEC. It's becoming ever more professionalized. The schools are an afterthought. You know. You know. They're sort of like. You have the school to have a football team, and Mike Leach, who is a one who I'd written about once, uh, is a delightful character who would provide a view on it that would be so good. He died. Uh, that's what I would have done if he had lived. You could have found some other coach to track, though, if you really wanted to go that route. But you'd need to find a coach who you really could pay, light up on the page, okay, and who would let you in. So who would let who would let me see everything? And Mike Leach, I knew, would let me see everything. And, uh, and he's quite a character. Oh my God. I'm mean, yes. So anyway, so I had that in mind when I met Sam. I thought the character in the situation is he's like walking social satire. He acquired twenty two and a half billion dollars in a flash, and the world was reorganizing itself around him. They, everybody wanted. Everybody something. wanted. By the these. way, the the twenty two point five, and I don't know if this is from the book or or my research. Forbes settled on that number. They suspected it could have been high as a hundred billion, but they just couldn't. They, come up they with know, ways of showing. How do you value piles of serum and Solana and FTT uh, and and, what, and who knows what the hell is inside of Alameda Research? Right, which raises an interesting question. Once you decide to write this, you have to know you're going to be going to be discussing crypto. But before you began work on Going Infinite, did you have any thoughts on, on Bitcoin, blockchain, NFTs, Ether? Like, what were you thinking about prior? So going back to about... I don't know, maybe 2012, I had made several runs at writing about crypto, mainly at the behest of crypto people because mm-hmm. they wanted attention. And I mean, the first one was funny. I, I hadn't noticed that. Is that? A... I never wrote it. Oh, okay. I, I mean, I went and spent time and interviewed people and I just thought- So you never I put anything, so you had some well, I'll tell, rudimentary I sense. I the, the, the first time I make it make some bid to, to get to know the people and to write a story about it, A guy called me up from Palo Alto. He had a legitimate crypto business. He said, if you come down, there's some people, just come down in the next few days to this house. There's some people I want you to meet, and one of them is Satoshi. And... And I, I fell for it. I, you know, I thought. So yeah, I was gonna say that's. Too <laughs> nice, right? Well, but but you know, it was 2012, so maybe maybe Satoshi's gonna reveal himself to me. Right. Early. And so I went down and I got out of the car about a block from the house, and you could smell the weed from a block from the house. <laughs> and I got in the house, and there were like 12 entrepreneurs with sleeping bags in this crashing in this multi-million dollar house in Palo Alto, and some of them turned out to be quite prominent in crypto. Mm-hmm. But the problem was this is this is what turned me off. They said at that moment they were selling crypto as it's going to replace fiat currency. It's right. going to be the means of exchange. And you've talked about how the narrative has changed consistently. They keep changing and, the story and just never, never finds a narrative it, that sticks. It's not that there's nothing there. It's just that whatever is there has not clicked with with a, like a serious problem in a serious way. But at that moment, it was I spend the day with them, and they they're selling me as hard as they can sell me that this is going to be we're not going to need dollars very soon. And I said, but can you use it? And they said, here, we'll show you. And they put some Bitcoin on my phone. And we walked into Palo Alto to the one coffee shop that accepted Bitcoin as currency. (laughs) And I bought a latte. Which probably cost you a million dollars. No, no, no. This gets better. The coffee shop, though it in theory accepted Bitcoin, it took 10 minutes and they gave up. They couldn't do it. And I said, I got an idea. I have this thing called a dollar. (laughs) I'll just use this. It's a miracle. And I had this thought. I thought like... They're selling this thing, but if, if, if in some wacky world, Bitcoin was the first currency, and then someone came along and invented dollars, right? everywhere they go, thank God, right? right? So, I, so I just thought, it's not right. There's, like, there's something to lampoon, but it's, I don't want to do that. It wasn't, it wasn't ready for you to write it wasn't about. Getting, it wasn't ready for me to write about. So Sam Bankman-Fried is this fascinating, quirky character. You decide to embed with him like a military journalist embedding with the troops. So uh, while they're covering a war, 
what was that like? Was it difficult to maintain arm's length objectivity? Because you're a journalist, essentially. So I ne- and you're you're like trailing this guy. Right. So the first thing, I mean, if I had to go back, I had a hard time remembering it, but if I go back and I think, what was it that made me think, not just this character, but this situation, um, that it what part of it was he wasn't trying to sell me crypto right that he himself didn't completely swallow crypto that he wasn't a religionist he said basically i am using it to make money because there are all these inefficiencies i don't know what's going to happen with it he wasn't it was the first crypto person not to pitch crypto to me that's really interesting and it was interesting it made him more interesting to me and i th- it was the first time i thought ah this may be the way into crypto because to me what was interesting about crypto at that point was I mean, the technology is interesting. The, fi- the whole financial structure that's arisen in crypto, it's interesting. It's not a book by me. What's interesting and is a book by me are the social consequences of all of a sudden there being $3 trillion of new wealth that's just, it's in randomly distributed. And it- Well, not so randomly distributed. Not so, no. it, it's mostly dudes. It's crypto that's bros. Right. That's right. And there's a reason why Lamborghini sold out for two years. That's right. That's right. So, it's have fun being poor. So I didn't answer your question, but so this is the why of it. So embedding, I always embed, right? That's what I do. Mm-hmm. The, the, the goal is to get to a point with the subject where you're, sitting in their office with a desk and they don't even know you're there anymore. So does that compromise your objectivity as a journalist? It never has before. Okay, that's uh, a fair answer. I mean, I, I've never, I, nobody's- Because pe- people are saying, oh, oh Michael yeah, yeah, yeah. got so close to SBF and he's defending him. I didn't read the book that way. I read it as an explanatory, this not is, a defense. No, it's, it but was- But that's a, the accusation. The radical act was just to tell the story as I saw the story. Mm-hmm. What? What possible purpose, what possible good would it do me to set myself up as Sam's Bankman Freed's defense counsel? And that's not what it was. And in fact, it's all kinds people of people ask me, uh, find out what he got paid. I'm like, are you kidding? So people said this about Flash Boys. Oh, and really? A Wall Street firm published a note that I had been given shares in IEX to write Flash Boys. And not true, right? Of course, not true. And and full disclosure, not only did you get a butt ton selling the book. You sold the movie rights before this even came out. Why would anyone else have to pay you for this? It's well, such a silly qu- accusation. So, so it's people, I, well, this, let me, let's just actually establish the relationship. So of course, I don't get paid anything. <laughs> of course, I didn't have any financial interest in FTX. Or, in fact, I'm a creditor. I have $2,000 on the US <laughs> exchange that I'm waiting to get out of the bankruptcy. There you go. Uh, Cause I wanted to see how it worked, you know? Right. And, um, the the uh, Sam Bankman Fried, neither Sam Bankman Fried nor anyone in his operation ever asked me what I was doing, asked me why I was doing it, questioned my the questions I was asking, forbid me from seeing. There was only one moment, one part of his empire that I had to fight to see. Like he had to say, he had, first he said, "I can't let you into that meeting because the people are going to be too uncomfortable." Mm-hmm. And but other than that, it was just like it's here. You just watch, you ask, you can ask anybody any question you want to ask. And it took me a while to get to that point. But uh, so they had no finger. They've been, they, as far as I know, they haven't read it. So nobody, nobody reads the book until it comes out. Right. And that's the deal I've had with everybody I write about. And it's sort of like at some point you just have to leave me alone and trust that I'm not some sinister person. Let, let me ask you a question that's going to make you feel old. Given how famous you are in Wall Street finance circles from Liar's Poker forward, any of these 20-somethings know who the hell you are? They all love Flash Boys. They do? Okay. Yeah. So they had a sense of- Oh, no, no, no. They all had books to sign and all yeah. that. So the, um, so the answer is yes. It was odd what they knew. Sam, not Liar's Poker, not no. The Big Short, not Moneyball. Those when, are the really so, the big three. So Sam- Or the Undoing Sam, Project. Sam never said this, but I found out from his parents that he adored Moneyball when he was a little kid. And oh, Of course really? he did, because he was, sure. like, uh, he was a totally isolated math geek sitting alone in his room who felt powerless. And all of a sudden, this book says the things you can do actually could change baseball. But, uh, but that apart from that, no, that was just the weird old guy, right? It, I mean, that's I mean, that was kind of what it was. Uh, they were so odd themselves as a collection of characters. It's the best. Look, FTX, never mind Sam. FTX was the best collection of characters I've seen in a financial operation since Solomon Brothers. Wow. Because they were just like, they, they were all these random people. Like it wasn't, they weren't filtered in the way that a financial firm usually filters people. Mm-hmm. It was like the odd collisions that happened between the world and FTX, and from the world, odd people had entered FTX. Huh, amazing. 
you spend a lot of time talking about what an odd, quirky, sort of socially misfit kid he was. What was the source of that? Was that Sam his, himself? Was that his parents? Was that other people? How did you get paint that picture of a, a young SBF? So I think it, it's partly because of how I grew up and the importance of like who my parents were and who my friends were and who my coach was. It, when I, when I try to get to know somebody, it, I go right to the childhood. Right. And it, sometimes that stuff that's a that's a mislead that, that doesn't lead you anywhere. It, so Sam, I asked him, I'd like just a list of people who who knew you before the age of 18 who could give me some picture of you just to start out right and uh he said that there's nobody i said what do you mean there's nobody he well, said, it was a guy he played the game with well, i right? pushed and pushed and finally it's his the list is his parents who who you know they did observe him <laughs> and his little brother who says i didn't know him mm-hmm. and his uh he was a tenant in the house his little brother said and there was one guy named matt nass who sam met in middle school and he became partners in play in this game they played called magic the gathering mm-hmm. and what matt matt Ness's chief attribute was he made no emotional demands on sam and they seemed to hardly talk uh they just sat there and played together and you see them together now and they still will sit together and not hardly talk so there was it was that and matt would say you know they were Sam, they weren't that close in some ways. They were close. They're close playing games together. Mm-hmm. So you had this kid who was he was totally isolated. In, in a, in a, you can imagine if other circumstances, a child might end up being very isolated. But he is the child of two very social professors living on the Stanford right. campus who have a world around them of really smart and interesting people. And Sam gets Sam is known by nobody. And the 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 so the question is why. Um, he he had he still has horrible problems with social interactions mm-hmm. uh but when he's a kid he i mean he, he he did he realized for example that he didn't know how to make facial expressions right he teaches himself to smile and finds out that that solves a problem within the game that is the simulation of life that's exactly right he sits in front of a mirror but it's not till college and and learns to make the facial expressions that are appropriate to what someone says but he, he's irritated that he has to do it he does. He realizes he doesn't have a full complement of human feeling. That he doesn't feel happiness. He doesn't feel pleasure. Really, he doesn't feel empathy. Uh, and that this is, you know, it's just like he he and he realizes the people around him uh, see him as not completely human. So I have a question that I was going to ask you later on, but I might as well bring it up here. So it's already come out. He's being treated with the MSAM patch for Adderall and Adderall for ADHD and depression. The persona in the book that you just described kind of reminded me a little bit of the reference you make in the big short to Michael Burry, who, when he finds out his son has Asperger's, has himself tested, and he's on Asperger's. So the obvious question is, I have seen no mention of this anywhere. Sam on the autism slash Asperger's spectrum? Whatever it is that he's diagnosable with, is so much more extreme than Michael Berry. Really? Oh, yeah. And it's, I don't know, so I don't use any of those words in the book. Because, I, because, I, I noticed yeah, that, which yeah. is what made me ask the question. By and, the way, nobody has brought that up anywhere in any interview. I found something buried in a Reddit where someone brought it up. But other than that, because I was hunting to see, hey, this guy, I'm not a diagnostician, but... I've read enough about this. I've worked with enough of those folks. I've had enough people with Asperger's on the show. You know, the word that, it's funny, whatever word you would use would put him in a box that probably he doesn't belong in because he fe- it feels different from what I've seen before. Okay. Of those bo- and I tell you, it seems different. He's very, very good at reading you. Uh, which, which people on the spectrum generally are not. So, so there's this odd one-way thing. He reads you very well, but he's hard to read uh, as a kid. So the other thing about it, the important beats in his childhood, I think, are, are one, his parents don't think of him as gifted. They worry about him. They think of him, and their par- his parents' friends said to me, they thought the parents were both afraid for and of him, huh. which was a curious thing to say about a parent and yeah. a child. And the, it's not until he's in middle school when his mom finds him sobbing in his room alone, and he says, I'm just so bored, that she realizes that he's an average student, and he's an average student because whatever's coming out of the teacher's mouth just did not interest right, he him. He knows it. There's a piece in the book where 
he his mom is going to give a, a paper somewhere, and like the eight year old gives her a read on the paper more sophisticated than the PhD candidates gave her a, as a critique. So it was it was a bit like. He was he was waiting. He wasn't living his childhood. He was waiting it for it to end, right. so that he could start talking to people. And in any case, he's eventually he's identified as gifted mathematically. Right. So so he's brilliant at math. He goes to MIT to study study physics and math. So it, so brilliant, but not that brilliant. So brilliant oh, enough. Really. So brilliant enough so that sure he goes to math camp in the summer and fi- kind of finds his tribe. But in math camp, he's not the best. He's he's kind of just average at, among the brilliant math kids. He's average. So he he has no sense of himself as special until he collides with Wall Street. So that's where I was about to go. So he goes from MIT to Jane Street Trading, which is a high frequency trading shop where it's really partly about math, but mostly about probabilities and problem solving and game playing where he excels. And it's sort of quantifying what what usually doesn't get quantified. Quantifying things that seem to be sort of subjective. The test that he gets, this is where he finds out, oh my God, I'm actually off the charts good at this. Right. The Jane Street interviews where they're making him do all kinds of weird puzzles and solve puzzles and play games and make bets that he just, he flies through the thing. And he realizes that what he's good at is not, it's not, it's not chess he's good at. It's, it's chess where you're on a clock, you can only, you have five seconds to make the move, and every five minutes, someone shouts a rule change. So the, <laughs> right. the queen is now a rook. And so every, it's, it's semi-chaos. But not he to, can manage that. He, he can manage that. It's not that he's better than, than when he's playing ch- regular chess. It's that everybody else is worse. You, and that's a quote right from the book. It wasn't that he thrived on the pressure. He just didn't feel it. He wasn't better than usual. He just wasn't worse. Most people felt emotions he did not, and therefore performed poorly under pressure. And you know what I think? I think this is an inc- this is a really important key to everything that happens next in Sam Bankman Fried's life because once he discovers that it's this environment, it's sort of the semi chaotic environment where mathematical aptitude, ability to quantify, ability to make quick judgments about probabilities really benefit you. But there's no clear, perfect right answer. He's so good compared to other people in that environment. He creates that environment over and over and over so he can be the best. I think it's that, that's like the beginning of the understanding of Sam Bankman fried He loves that feeling of being the best. Who doesn't? It's a weird environment, and he realizes what it is, so he creates it. Jane Street, the markets create it for him. So right. mar- it's a really good, you know, it's, he's a natural in the markets. Uh, but even in his, like, own company, the reason there's chaos in his company he, I would tell you there are reasons we don't have job titles and we have no organization chart and there's no list of employees and nobody knows who's supposed to be doing what. But in fact, he wanted everybody to be in the same state of chaos. That, that's where he won. Allows him to thrive. I, I love the story at Jane Street where he figures out that they can scrape each state's presidential election data oh, yeah. and <laughs> figures out they get a five-minute lead on CNN and they start trading futures overnight in 2016 in the presidential election. They're up $300 million. Tell us what happens. This is an amazing story. I love that part. So this is there's some scoops in the Jane Street part of the book, I think. I mean, just assembling a portrait of Jane Street is not easy because they just won't talk to you. Right. But, but, but Sam sort of created the portrait because he hired so many former Jane Street right. people, and they felt free to talk. But there was the trade, the Trump trade. So Sam Bankman was partly responsible for the worst trade in Jane Street history, as far as he knew, which started out as a giant winner. That's right, and it's but it's if you really think about it, it's a wild trade. So going into the 2016 election, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, it looks like every time there's good news for Trump in the weeks running up to the election, the markets tank. It looks like that's the trade. If you can, the trade is: can you get election information before the rest of the market? Now it seems like a wild idea. That seems like information that is everybody's going to get basically at the same time. But in fact, where everybody's getting it is from John King on CNN. And John King has commercials, and John King has to walk from getting the data to get to his board. The data is slow to get to John King. So Jane Street creates its own data gathering system in the important states. People took Right, it's just Florida and Ohio and Virginia. And and they're sometimes moments and sometimes hours ahead of CNN in knowing what just happened in the election and how the odds just shift shifted and what John King's going to say next and what that's going to do in it to S&P futures. So their bet they put on, in retrospect, they should have maybe thought more about the bet, 
but it was good for Trump, short S&Ps in a big way and short in foreign markets like Mexican markets or whatever in a less big way. And during the night, it, it, as it progresses, it looks like the genius trade. The markets collapse. Sam Bankman-Fried goes home at like three in the morning and they're up $300 million. He sleeps for six hours and comes back. And the problem is the international markets stayed down, but the U.S. stock market popped back up. Tax cuts and fiscal stimulus, what's not going to be good for equities? And so it went from a $300 million win to a $300 million loss. The and biggest in Jane Street history. So not, not much of this makes it into the book, but there were these long memos that were written about in Jane Street about the trade. Oh, really? Yeah, I've got them. Because uh, there was no postmortem. No one ever pulled him aside and said, so the, hey, you blew us up. It, it so was just Sa like Sam wrote these long memos to his boss about we need to write long memos about this because we ought to understand what we did because this is a wild opportunity. We got in from we succeeded. We got the information before anybody else. It wasn't in the market. Nobody else had it. You didn't see the markets move when we got the information. We right. were the only ones there. So he describes like how they should have thought about the trade and what they should have done is they should have shorted international markets. That was this, that, that was the, and, and maybe even hedged it against with the U.S. markets. Uh, that's his view. But he can't get his superiors to engage. They just like think, as he put it, that we just shouldn't be doing this. Like this is not our wheelhouse. And it disappointed him. I mean, I think he thought set, set the grounds for him to exit. It was one of several things, but yes, it, it, he, which is, and if you think about this, you got to kind of love Jane Street. Uh, that in my in my day, if someone had done this, there would have been a scapegoat. Someone, oh, absolutely. Someone had been strung. There up. would have been a committee. There would have been a review. Yeah, someone would have been fired. Yeah. Uh, Tarred and feathered, drummed out of Wall Street. This is a very smart place because the process was right. The outcome was a problem. Mm -hmm. The process was mostly right. And it wasn't no, some... No second level thinking. They no didn't second... stop and say, all right, so what happens if he's elected? That's right. And uh, But that they don't go punish Sam and the handful of people who are really at the center of it. I, if I were Sam, it would cause me to love my employer. For sure. Right? It'd be a reason to stay. And for him, it becomes a reason to leave. And that's our part of a reason to leave. That's curious. So let's talk a little bit about Alameda Research and FTX. Alameda predates FTX. It's the um, sort of hedge fund trading operation that Sam Bankman-Fried is operating under. And it begins arbitraging crypto between like Asia and the United States and making a ton of money in what should be something that in the equity markets, there wouldn't be that big a gap. Tell, so, so tell the, us about so that. So the basic idea, he's sitting at Jane Street and uh, his financial ambition is limitless, not because he wants to buy a yacht, but because he wants to save humanity from existential risk. But never mind that for a minute. Uh, and um, he looks at the crypto markets, and this is two th late 2017. And they exploded, right, that year. And they're, it's a trillion dollar market. And the Jane Streets of the world, which are engaged in this sort of radical radical efficiency inside of financial markets, like efficient to a microsecond. But but heavily regulated. But heavily regulated, but but that getting information into the markets as fast as information can be gotten into the markets, um, that isn't happening in crypto. It's not happening to the extent that um, you know, a Bitcoin is trading for a uh, thousand in Japan and eight hundred in the United States, and literally that's the gap. Yeah, it's I mean, giant. It's it's huge. Sometimes, like, it's like it would be twenty cents in the in in equities, and it's it's two hundred dollars. That's right. It's so the, Sam looks at that and says, "We can be, I can be Jane Street for crypto," and uh, and but then from then it becomes high comedy because he he's doing it for, on behalf of his movement, effective altruism. And his idea of starting it is to start it with a bunch of effective al altruists in Berkeley, where there's money from effective altruists to supply the capital. So so let's define effective altruists, because I, I, I read a lot of stuff about it, and I don't think people really get, get it. it. This is a philosophical movement that really began in, in was it Cambridge? Yeah, you, Oxford. Oxford. And it, it, and it migrates goes, to it goes, Berkeley. It, it grows out of utilitarianism and the general idea. I mean, we're thinking about it as sort Meaning of Meaning like, maximize the benefit for the most amount of people. That's right. And and be actually mathematically rigorous about how you do your good. Like uh, and, you, you call that into question also, as did uh, yeah, I. But, but yeah, we'll we'll talk about that yeah. later. Never mind what you think of effective altruism. Made up numbers. You just need to. Yes, you just. But you need to just accept this is 
this has captivated the minds of the 20 people who Sam Bankman Free gathered to create the first Jane Street for crypto in Berkeley, California in 2017. And, and these folks are literally, they set up charities, people are donating money, and they figure out what are the biggest threats to, human, to humanity and we'll donate money to those causes. We'll find smart ways to donate money mm -hmm. to those causes. That's right. And um, we, So go out and make a ton of money and, right. and yeah. give it away. At that moment, they were pretty focused on on existing human beings and saving their lives. So mm -hmm. it was like a lot of public health in Africa, So that, which is pretty straightforward. Sure. The mo movement was about to jump the shark and and ex focus on future humans who'd never been born who, but by preventing existential catastrophe, preventing, so, so they stopped giving money for bed nets to prevent malaria in Africa, and they start giving money to Anthropic or whatever to to, to AI right. out people who are, who are thinking about AI risk, um, so it becomes it becomes a more complicated thing. In any case, they have appetite for virtually unlimited dollars. Sam is making a pitch to his fellow effective altruists. This is a market in which we can make unlimited dollars. Almost none of them have a financial background. All of them are kind of under thirty. Uh, some of them are basically twenty, and um, and they gather together and it works for a bit, like weeks. For, for a few weeks, they're able to do some trades that make, you know, I think half a million dollars a day kind of thing. They were doing pretty well. And, but very quickly, Sam has created his semi-chaotic environment in which only he can operate and stay sane. And he's driven everybody else bad <laughs> uh, and, and, and half of the people in the, there's a management committee of five people and the other four think he is either insane or criminal, or both, and because they've started, they've, they can't, they don't even know where the money is. Like it's out. Plus, of, that, right at this point, they go from winning to losing. They go from winning. The trades start to go bad, or it looks like they go bad, and some of the, they have, don't have a record of some meaningful number of trades. Which is a little foreshadowing in the book that oh my god that th there's no we'll talk about this. There's no record keeping. There's no CFO. There's none Nothing. of the normal controls. None of the normal controls. And Sam has created this algorithmic algorithmic trading bot he called it model bot that he wants to, it's like release the kraken he wants to release right. in the markets and make two hundred fifty thousand trades a day and they're and, horrified and it's they, just going to crash and burn well they were been given 175 million dollars from fellow rich effective altruists and they're thinking we're supposed to be making money to give away and we're losing effective altruist dollars right and it gets everybody's everybody gets upset and it, what, there comes a moment where they realize that actually four million dollars of ripple XRP is the token, but the, a ripple is missing. And they just literally, they can't How find much? four million. For them, it was a lot, All right. but it's like gone. Like we, have, we, we don't know where it went and how much more is gone. And Sam's attitude is, I don't worry, let's keep trading because you know markets are only going to be good for so long and Jane Street's going to come out, come out and wipe us out. And so let's, and, th and their attitude is no, we need to stop trading and find the ripple. And this becomes a war. In the end, every, all the rest of the management team quits, takes big severance packages and quits. Half the firm leaves. I interviewed all these people. And if you interview them now, they, one of them will say, I still think he's kind of crooked. The others say we overreacted. Um, but in any case, the punchline was, it is total chaos. They were probably right. To, I, I mean, they were at huge risk. He created his environment in which he flourished. But once they leave, they find the money. It's there. It's a, the ripple is on some South Korean exchange, and the South Korean exchange is bewildered that no one has come. No one's come. I mean, right. so we, we found the which dudes. is the theme that keeps repeating. It's repeating on. itself. Like, and hey, is this your hundred and fifty million dollars? That's right. And uh, and so that was a moment where you had a foreshadowing of what might happen later uh, in Alameda research. But it, it gets it finds its footing, and it's kind of fine. It does well for the next... The, the next day, after everybody leaves, he turn, He releases the Kraken. He releases the Kraken, and it And works. it starts cr killing. It it's does, making a ton of money. It does well. Yes, it does well. When does he come to realize, hey, you know, some of the other players are coming in, and these big, fat arbitrage opportunities are going away? So he was the one who made markets. He was the one who everybody noticed in crypto. What just happened to the spreads? Oh my God, like some something just happened. It all of a sudden started to look like a real Wall Street market. And and it took a while for people to figure out that there was this wholly anonymous operation called Al Alameda Research with this vegan 26 year old who was behind it. Uh, so it's about, a, what is it, about a, nine months? Where Sam and Alameda starts to realize they have a lot of competition, and this and and it is not it, they, the markets will never be as fat as they were. It's going to be more complicated, and they start thinking about other ways to make money, 
and therefore, and, and that's the genesis of FTX. This is the, so FTX. It's important to know that this is how FTX comes about, and it's also important to know that they didn't think they had the capacity to actually run an exchange. Running exchange meant having customers. It meant dealing with ordinary people. That was the big issue. How are we going to get people? We, to do this? People are going to. I don't. I don't know how to talk to people. I don't know what people feel. How on earth am I going to be like a carnival barker at the middle of an exchange? So he knew he had the ability to create the software. His CTO, brilliant guy, Gary Wang. Uh, uh, basically, one guy writes all the code better than everybody else that's yes, out there. Yes, which apparently didn't take much, but was true, and. Their thinking is, we'll get some, we'll get people who understand people to do this for us. They mm -hmm. went to all the other exchanges and said, we'll sell you this and we'll keep a kind of licensing fee, but we don't want to run it. And nobody wanted it. And so they get, they, they all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, if we're going to do this, we got to do it ourselves. So they ba really back into creating an exchange. It's not, it, it was not, and he really had severe doubts about whether he was going to be able to pull this That's off. That's interesting. And, there, there are two things that really leapt out about the launch of FTX. The first is all these other exchanges sort of socialize losses. So you're, you're doing futures trading and every customer effectively is putting up money. And if somebody has a big loss and it drops way below the, the collateral they put up, that loss gets spread out. So his brilliant idea is, hey, we'll have tight stops. If someone loses money, we liquidate the collateral. They're done. We're not going to have losses yet. That's right. They, they, they built a better risk engine. This is funny given what happened, but yes. They're, well, the, on the, the, on the, the futures trading, yes. that risk engine was very professional and well done. That's right. And it was, it was this chief – there were other selling points, but it was probably the chief selling point was – all you crypto traders have now had the misery of socialized losses on all these exchanges, and you've just lived with it. You know, you get these clawbacks of 40 and 50 percent of your trades because somebody blew up and we're not going to have that. And that so that that is what they were selling. But problem with Sam is he never sold anything. Right. Uh, and he had he, if you think about his background, not only is he entirely isolated as a child. When he gets to Jane Street, he's in a culture where it's just regarded as the, mo the most foolish thing in the world to say anything to anyone about what you do. They, they are phobic about media attention. Uh -huh. It's all bad. And it's, their, their attitude towards the world is, is suck information out of it. Don't put information into it. But you can't sell that way. You have to go out and present yourself to people. And this is the big moment in Sam Bankman Street's life when all of a sudden he realizes that, oh, I have to be a, a character or I have to be a a person out there and um so he starts going to conferences and he's the guy that was scalping all the that cash and suddenly he kind of becomes a bit of a star well bloomberg launches him the first <laughs> first tv show right that's right first yeah, we're, TV we're in the place that launches him uh that he goes on tv he is by my lights very awkward on tv right i mean playing he, a video game he's while playing he's on a, live tv he's on live tv at his computer monitor playing a video game at the same time you can see his eyes <laughs> going back and forth right. you can see him stall not half listening to the questions he's being asked he always says it's you can oh that's a really good question right just oh, that's, delay. uh yeah d just he give himself a little beat he's not he, and then he he's off he just he gives a little soliloquy in in response to every question but he doesn't seem guarded in any way he seems completely open and is probably much more open. And he, although he's a little jittery, right? His knee, knee is bumping, bouncing up and down. Jackhammering. Yeah, but but it works. It's like the person who or his his PR person. She'd never done PR before. They'd hired Natalie. Her, Natalie. Natalie Tian said she looked at Sam. She said, "You know, when people meet Sam, they feel some. They sense his vulnerability. They're really interested in what comes out of his mouth. They see he's odd." But they kind of like his oddness. I'm just going to see if that oddness works on TV, and it did. I mean, it just did. Uh, and so all. So he goes from there to every major crypto exchange, and suddenly every major crypto conference in in Asia. They're located in Hong Kong. Well, suddenly the they time. start to get volume, right? right? Uh, and, and money starts to flow to FTX. And if you look at if you look at the way people have made money in crypto, there are like two basic strategies. You bought Bitcoin at zero, or you bought it low and it went way up. Or you create an exchange. The exchanges have been the sources of great fortunes, and it's it's and it's such a simple, easy business if you manage the risk, right? Right. It's like you take you take a, a, a you're big, the casino. You're the casino. That's right. Instead of instead of getting your money by 
playing games with better odds against your customers. You're just taking a slice of each transaction, but you're the casino. And he was, FTX appealed because of where Sam came from and because of the way it was designed immediately to big institutional trading, which was coming in, the, the jump tradings, the tower researches. So you, you had started to have volume there. It was slower to appeal to the retail people who the who the institutional people want to interact with, but they, it, I mean, it was the fastest growing exchange. Uh, and it, it and, and to put some flesh on those bones, two bips they were earning on two hundred fifty billion dollars a month, which meant they're doing you do the math a few billion dollars in revenue and four hundred million in profits. It was a, it ended up being I think in two thousand twenty one it's a billion and a billion in revenues and the, I've about four hundred million in profits. That's so just you've huge. got this business. It's a really simple business that is growing so fast. And you, if you're looking at it as like, what might happen to this business? It seems to be poised. It's only whatever, 8% of the marketplace to grow to be 20 or 30% of the marketplace. The marketplace end of 2021 is a couple of two or $3 trillion. But that, I mean, who knows? It's a, it's a tulip. People bubble. were talking about a hundred trillion. Yes, that's just crazy. Right. So it's this, this business is going to be in direct proportion to that. But there's this other thing. It is a different financial structure, this exchange. Um, it is for for a start. It, cus- it custodies the customer's money, but secondly, it doesn't require any intermediaries. You trade directly on the exchange, and right. you keep you don't you don't go through a broker. You don't have any high frequency trader between you and the and the marketplace. Uh, the exchange isn't selling your data. Um, what if this model finds its way into the ordinary financial markets? What if they can trade stock futures? What if they can trade commodities? Venture capitalists look at this and thought, "My God, this is a trillion dollar company if it goes right." And uh, and it's that's when when the when the when he starts to interact, when he starts to get big time venture capital money, he starts to get normalized. It starts to become something different than an ordinary crypto exchange. Hmm. Really, really intriguing. You go on sixty minutes as you have for some of your recent books. Yep. I thought the interview tracked the book, which I had literally just finished that day. Right. Very closely. Hard to do in 26 minutes a whole book, but yes. They, 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 so yeah, two segments. Right, Most people right. only get one segment. What was your experience like with 60 Minutes and and some of the backlash to the interview? Well, backlash was anticipated. I mean, Really? Uh, I did not anticipate oh, that. Oh, I read yeah. the book and thought, this is a fun romp in a crazy part of the world. Well, that's what will happen eventually. People will read the book. But um, this is how I think about it. I think I said this on 60 Minutes. That we're now in kind of a story war. That about the story. What right. is the story of Sam Bankman-Fried? Um, lots of people who didn't know very much about him or it have told lots of stories with great conviction. Um, Twitter lynched him right away without thinking very much about. Why. I lynched. We had a dinner. What was it last yeah. December with right. a, a number of people who were very interested right. in the space. Right. And you kept saying, it, "Whatever you think, it's more ten com- times it's, crazier it, than it, you. It, imagine. It's crazier than you imagine, and more complicated and more fun." Actually. And that turned out to be yeah. a fair description. And uh, But the story we're now is going to be a very loud story that comes out of the prosecution and a story that probably presented in a more muted way from the defense. Mm-hmm. And I don't think either of those stories are going to be very good or full or complete. They, they, they're not going to be nearly what I have just from having been a fly on the wall for right. a year and a half. And I know what I think. Uh, like of the, I know I know what I experienced and what it felt like what if, with the, the spirit in which things were done with this guy as best as possible who this guy is and how he behaves and how he thinks uh, interviewed all around him interviewed all his colleagues before they all got hauled off by the Department of Justice <laughs> and so I just had I, I had a peculiar privileged view of it right the prosecutors haven't spoken to Sam did they speak to you they asked for the book but they didn't speak to me well when did they when did you give him the book we didn't give him the book so they've got it now. Say go to Amazon, go buy your own. Kind of, and that's interesting. And uh, and um, and the defense can't talk to Caroline or Gary or Nishad or a whole but bunch of other people. They're witnesses, but they're and I still can, have been able to talk to a lot of the witnesses. Huh. So not all of them, but a lot of them. And so I've got like unusual three sixty view of the whole yeah. thing. And it's it was such an amazing just story. I thought I'm just going to tell a story. And the radical act is to withhold judgment, like innocent till proven guilty. But uh, that, but leave that objective to, journalism. But leave that to one side. Right. There's just this story, and all the books when they work, they work. 
I have this experience with every book. Ten different readers will read ten different books. The we t- have discussed this. The book you write is not the book people read. That's exactly right. They come to it with their baggage, and they supply. They f- walk into the hole in the book. And this came with a ready-made hole. Right. You, you're Good the guy or bad guy. You're the juror. You get to decide. It's you. You decide. And I can tell you that I have had the most radical range of responses to the book and to the characters. More than any book you've ever written. More than any book I've ever written. And, and it's a mistake to think that I had some ambition some some ambition to affect like the trial outcome that's preposterous the trial right. is going to be the trial that, that but i did want to force the reader to to grapple with how they felt about this situation once they'd seen the situation in full and uh and that seems to offend people who um have already just made up their mind about him uh, well well once you make your mind up you know it's very hard to walk it back you dedicate the book to your daughter in memory of Dixie Lee Lewis. You remain inside of me. Tell us about that, because I recall after your daughter's accident, you kind of described yourself as, I don't know if I'm ever writing again. Yeah, that is true. Uh, I had a very specific response. It was a tiny sliver of my response to her death. You know, I, I adored her, and we were just, she was the best kid. Uh, brave and full of love and just the best kid. And... I thought up to that point in my life that I was just, that was the luckiest person I knew. Nothing bad really had ever happened to me. I hadn't had that kind of experience. And I'd also thought that kind of the trick about, I think of writing as a kind of trick. It's like, I don't know where it comes from. I, I, I can do this thing, I don't know why. But I've always associated it with joy and pleasure and a kind of happiness. And I wondered whether I'd feel that again mm-hmm. when I sat down before a blank computer screen. And it was joyous to find that I did feel it. Like I didn't, that I was right back in my place with maybe a little extra thing in me uh, when I sat down to write this thing. And, but, I, but before I did that, I just didn't know. I just didn't know whether, like I was so fundamentally changed that I would never want to do this. I, I very vividly, a uh, mutual friend said, hey, you should give Michael a call. So we spoke a few months afterwards, and you said something that, you know, you're such a mensch. I was genuinely shocked at this point when you're still mourning, and you said, hey, this tragedy showed me that up until this point how lucky I actually was. Most humans aren't wired to think that way. That's a very unusual perspective Mm -hmm. to look at something that's not good and try and find the, the goodness in a tragedy. So this is the way to honor her. The way to honor her is not to crumble. It's to to build on it. You call her a warrior, is that the thinking? She was an absolute warrior. But the way to honor her is is in the spirit of improv. Uh, it's, It's, you can't say no, you can't reject this. Rejecting her death uh, or rejecting the feelings that go with it is, is to deny her in some way. What I need to do is accept whatever the emotions are and build on them. And whatever I build will have a little of her in it. So this book has a little of her in it. You know what's in there about this in, in, in about her in this book? It very consciously. I knew when I wrote this book I was going to be in a war. I knew that there huh. I knew that there was a mob sentiment and we this culture is very good at f- whipping up mobs very fast twitter like exists for it it's an it's, out- an, it's an outrage it's an machine. outrage machine and people are so sure they're right uh, and that that mob to get between that mob and its target is always dangerous and dixie would have done it that huh. she 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 would she would put her body between a mob and had done it before that kind of thing sure. and so i thought it's going to be a little painful but it's worth it and it will honor her. So when you're talking to him and thinking, this is not long after her accident, you're thinking, I'm gonna go for this and she would absolutely support this decision. Absolutely. Huh, that's an amazing um, conversation. I remember you did a podcast, it's three actors, comedians, I don't remember. uh, Smartless. Smartless, Smartless, that's right. And uh, I try never to listen to people's podcast before I go on with them, Um, but we were doing the 25th anniversary of Liar's Poker, and I I listened to that, and the last segment 
was 15 minutes of you discussing Dixie. Uh, it, it, it was just the most poignant, beautiful conversation I've ever heard from anybody experiencing loss. So I get. Do you do you recall that podcast? And, I do, and, I do. I don't remember what I said, but I I do remember the spirit in which I said it. And in life, I have found, I mean, this connects to this book. It connects to many of my books. That there's a richness in recognizing and really insisting on any difference between what you feel and what you're supposed to feel. Uh, and there's always pressure to feel a certain thing, like this pressure right now to hate Sam Bankman Fried, but. If you actually feel something different, hold on to that feeling and explore it. And there's 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 great stuff in it, great life stuff, great literary stuff. And um, with my grief, right after she died, I was inundated uh, with correspondence, very well-meaning correspondence, from people who thought they'd gone through the same thing, and had on the surface gone through something similar, lost a child, right, and giving me advice, sending me books. You know, telling me how I was going, telling me how I was going to feel, and they were, it none of it rang true. I knew huh. how I knew how I felt, and I knew it was different from how they thought I should feel, and I thought that's interesting. And the books just looked like dead words on the page to me. So I thought, I felt this way when Dixie was born. I felt that way about fatherhood in the beginning. I just felt differently about my children than I was expected to feel. I didn't feel attached to them right in the beginning. It's like I had to learn to love my children. Love wasn't there in the beginning. You learn to love something or you come to love something by taking care of it, at least in my experience. And I hadn't taken care of them. Oh, as I taken care of them, I loved them. Uh, I felt with the grief, for example, a lot of people told me I, was, I, should, I, I would feel guilty. And I thought, what, why would I... F- I didn't, I didn't feel guilty. Survivor's guilt sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't feel guilty. I thought she had a fantastic life. We had a fantastic relationship. We had magical amounts of time together. That She was on her way to a brilliant future. It's, I feel sad, mm-hmm. but I don't feel guilty. I don't feel anger. Uh, I didn't feel any of the toxic emotions. I felt sad. And sad is that you can work with sad. Um, sad and funny this book I've just written is sad and funny. There's, I, it's, there's so much funny stuff in it, but it's a, it's a sad story. They go together, these emotions. You're in, a, you're in an emotional space rather than a kind of angry, you're in a rich emotional space rather than a kind of cheap emotional space. Huh, that, that, uh, that's really fascinating and, and unexpected take. Let's bring this back to the crew of 20-somethings running FTX. Um, I read the book not so much as in a def- defense of where FTX went off the rails, but just an explanation. Here are people with no experience in finance, no experience in management, no organizational structure, none of the usual controls in place to run a few million dollars, much less hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, how criminal was this, or was this really just terrible management run amok. Was there any criminal intent? Uh, That's the question at the heart of the trial. Mm -hmm. And... um, I mean, clearly there was commingling of funds. I'm going to answer this. Oh, yeah. It's all in there, right? It's all bad. There's no happy story uh, to explain it all. Um, But I want to say this. I don't want to answer the question because I've left the question for the reader to answer. I intentionally didn't answer the question because I didn't want my thumb on the scale. So I don't really want to answer this in interviews. Uh, So let me ask you But let me also add to that, just that it's quite possible that stuff will come out in the trial that has not come out yet that will change my views. So I don't know. So so let me- I'm withholding judgment. So let me pull something from the book that I thought was really fascinating and I think Twitter has gotten wrong. It wasn't that FTX transferred money to Alameda, transferred $8.3 billion. As I read it, FTX was unbanked. You could give them crypto, but you couldn't give them cash. Alameda had a pre-existing bank account, so you could wire money into Alameda, and then they're supposed to move it over to FTX. Is that a fair that's, statement? That's that's how eight of the 10 something billion that got into Alameda from FTX got and, in. And at one point in time, Alameda is sitting on like, I don't know, 90, $100 billion worth of assets. 
it's not that eight billion is a rounding error, but in the grand scheme of things, yeah, yes, yeah, so we'll make that mark to accounting eventually. So that would be the story Sam would tell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the the way you would challenge that story, and I do, uh, is we were really sitting on ninety billion dollars of you of 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 assets that was Solana and FTT and Serum. I mean, I, what what is it worth? You know. Yes, the market seems to say it's worth that, but it's not. And you, you couldn't liquidate you it. You couldn't liquidate it, right? The uh, the second thing is, it's just like, unless you know Sam Bankman Fried and know what he did back when he was trading the Ripple in Berkeley, that it seems preposterous that someone could not pay attention to $8 billion of other people's money that was in the wrong place. And that the minute they have bank accounts, or for that matter, you know, wallets to store crypto in, in FTX, because the dollars are going to become crypto, uh, that you move it over. Uh, so One would it's, think, right? it's inexcusable that it was there, but it does seem that it got, I mean, and how much difference it makes how it got there, I'm not clear. It may not make any difference at all legally, uh, but that that appears to be how it, most it of it got It came into there. Alameda yeah. from it, the client, not from FTX. Right. I, well, that I, that I, sounds like that's an important yeah, distinction. It's it may be. I, I mean, clearly, I, it, it's problematic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wh whether that amounts to fraudulent intent is again is for the jury to decide. That's right. That's going to be the interesting thing. What this is why you need to understand Sam Bankman Fried if you're the jury. It's like what would that mind have intended, uh, and that's what they will decide. I, his, you know, his odds are not good. So, so you mentioned FTT, which is the coin. This story was really, uh, this part of the, the narrative was really fascinating because I was unaware of this. So FTX issues FTT, which is effectively like equity in FTX. Yes. And they don't... Um, uh, it's got a claim on the revenues. Uh, right? So it, literally profit distributions right. go out to FTT holders. In the form of buybacks. So uh, in the form of they, buybacks of FTT. Right. So that's how you yeah. get you right. get paid on that. Right. Um, uh, that suddenly, uh, and he does it at like pennies, not, not a whole lot of money. Suddenly this runs up in price. Right. A at what point, what, what is FTX holdings of FTT worth? It, so as long as FTX is functioning and profitable, right. the FTT is actually pretty liquid and valuable. Uh, it, it, the minute FTX goes down, it's worth zero. Right. So it's all correlated. It's, it's a all going concern. And in fact, sort of pretty much everything in well, not that, not everything, but a lot that was in Alameda was simply one thing. Sam, FTX, FTT, Solana, even and Serum. These big these other tokens were so associated with him right. that if one thing if FTX went down, they were all going to go down. Uh, there there are parts of the story. It's funny when I think back of like former financial scandals. Mm -hmm. Madoff is not the analogy. Make people yeah, well, actually, so you've said this, and I have another question. So let me bring it up here. Madoff had a legitimate business. He was the largest market maker on the Nasdaq. Oh, way back when. Way back when, and and the problem is nobody really knows when his business turned into a Ponzi scheme. Right. Right. Uh, there've been multiple books. None of them have found that information. Right. Out. Here, it's pretty clear from the beginning. No controls, coal mingling of funds. Yeah, but FTX itself was never, never looked like right. the end of it. It was a legitimate business making a lot of money. Right. The, but this, this thing rhymes to me with both Michael Milken and with uh, long-term capital management. Long-term capital management didn't realize that all of its stuff was correlated because it owned it. And it right. went, once, you, once people started going after their positions and knew their positions, even if it was, you know, a position in Russian government bonds and over over here are position in gold. It didn't matter because everybody knew they were weak and these positions were going to be puked out. And so they, the collapse of Sam's world reminded me a little of that. And it reminded me a little of part Wait, of- Well, stay there before you move yeah, on. Yeah. So you talk about CZ right. um, basically starting a run on the bank and or a run on FTX because he starts saying- Hey, our FTT we've sold, and we have other things. We we're no longer uh, trusting uh, FTX as an exchange. Did he precipitate the entire collapse? Um, he he couldn't have done it. It's a combination of him and the moment in which he says what he says. Uh huh. And there's a reason I think he says what he says. He's even kind of hinted at this reason. Sam, idiotically, had made a trip to Dubai like the week, a week earlier, right. met with, with Anthony Scaramucci, 
right. I was actually invited on this trip. I didn't go. Uh, but he tried to persuade the Dubai regulators to throw Binance and CZ out of Dubai. R really? And, and, and they have an ongoing relationship, both uh, Sam and, and yeah. Binance and uh, Dubai and Binance. Yes. And, you know, Binance needs to find a home. It, it, Dubai has given them a home. CZ needs to find a home. Dubai has given him a home. And so Sam was basically trying to render CZ stateless. And uh, wildly I think, overplayed his uh, hand. Wildly overplayed his hand. It, it, that it was just a dumb thing to do. I mean, it gets to Sam, but if he thought he was vulnerable, mm -hmm. why would he have done that? Did he? So maybe he didn't think he was vulnerable. Right. That moment tells you, argues that Sam is oblivious at that moment to how weak his hand is. Because uh, you don't do it if your hand is right. that weak. I mean, it's really not going to get you very much. What well, we were you talking earlier? You go up against the king, you better better kill yeah. him. That's not miss. Uh, and the other thing is Sam was di potentially disruptive to U.S. financial structure. Uh that he he was arguing, he was making an argument that was similar to Brad Katsuyama's argument in Flash Boys. That a lot of unnecessary intermediation in the markets. And there's a much simpler way to do this. The, the structures are being built in crypto that could be ported into the U.S. stock market where all of a sudden, you know, the exchange isn't selling customer data for business. That offended and bothered a lot of existing players. So uh, you, you talk about this specifically towards the end of the book. The takeaway from FTX and crypto is the reason this collapsed, the reason crypto ha had another crypto winter, is there is no uh, banker of last resort to step up, and that it turns out capitalism needs guardrails, banks need regulations, and guess what? We all need intermediaries because the supposedly trustless sy system works much worse than the system uh, that that is highly regulated and supervised. Yes, it's it, it's a great irony to me of crypto that it starts out with Satoshi's paper, and and St Satoshi is clearly obsessed with, with 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 not wanting to have to trust governments and banks. The, the whole point of this is you. It, this is a way to eliminate banks and governments from the monetary system, and. Um, it's a trustless system. It's peer, you, you trade directly with someone else and the transactions are irreversible, et cetera, et cetera. And that he must be, if he's alive, if he's dead, he's rolling in his grave. Because <laughs> what happens next? Crypto goes and invents a whole nother financial system that looks an awful lot like the existing financial system, except without regulators. <laughs> right. Right. And it's, and, or deposit insurance. Right. And it's, and, and Which he, turns out to be a good thing, deposit insurance. Oh my God! Right, yeah, and so and regulators too. Um, it, and so who would have thought? I wouldn't have thought that crypto would end up in this place. It would end up with all of the same exchanges and brokers and banks that that the financial system has. Turns out there are reasons for these things. So so let's talk a little bit about the bankruptcy and the trustees and and what so far has been recovered. You write in the book, what, there's 8.3 billion missing. So there's 8.6 billion in customer deposits. This is all from the bankruptcy people. That's unaccounted for. That they that the customers are still owed. Okay. Including me. Right. Like 200 grand. And is you grand and, is and most of the employees had all their net that's, worth that's, tied up. These, right. these people were drank the Kool-Aid. They thought this was the next great thing. They're employees who had their whole families and had their parents, had their brothers and sisters in with their assets on FTX. Yes. Right, so 8.6 is owed. Yeah, and they've said they found seven, this is three months ago, and they said they were still finding it, 7.3 billion of liquid assets. Of liquid, and and in the book you talk about uh, other exchanges saying, hey, we have 300 million of your Ethereum here, come get it. The, the, when the thing is unraveling, people, not not Sam, probably Sam too, but people, not Sam, are getting phone calls from banks saying, we have, we have $300 million of dollars. In an account, do you know? And they didn't know about it, right? I mean, they, so I, and then I, you talk about the dragon's lair, which is all these assets. So he bought a hundred million dollars of Twitter a year before Musk buys it at like twenty dollars a share. So right. this is well, the big the, a ton of money. You know, the the elephant in the room is, and it's a really interesting elephant. 
So Sam Bankman Freed, one of his obsessions is artificial intelligence and making sure artificial intelligence doesn't slip its leash and eat us all, right? And this is before it's fashionable at all to think about this. Now, this the way back when nobody was thinking about it, or really few people. And he buys a stake in a company called Anthropic. Uh, he buys, a, I think at the time, it was a 20% stake. I can't remember exactly. I think it was 400 That's million? That's something like that. Some huge amount of money. Huge amount of money. And um, when the bankruptcy happens, the guy who's running the bankruptcy, John Ray, said to me, as, a, as an illustration of the idiocy of Simon Bankman Freed, said to me, can you believe he put like $400 million into this thing called Anthropic and it's just air? It's just an <laughs> idea. There's, no, there's nothing there. Well, last week, Amazon has announced they're making a four billion, up to $4 billion investment and it's a minority stake. So this company is now being valued at least $8 billion, more probably. And it seems going, like it's going to the moon. This is a, so that means his four hundred million that's is a, one of a, a three or a five x. Yes, and it's that's right. And so, so it very much looks like they may get paid back. Not not only they may get paid back, but the implication is, hey, if they had accounting and and a CFO, where is it possible that they were never truly insolvent? If you take all their assets and add them up, might they not have needed to go into bankruptcy? If there was an adult in the room running the place, well, if there's an adult in the room running the place, the money would never have been in the wrong place. But the but it's it's I think that's certainly true of FTX US. Mm -hmm. um, the well, uh, that was tiny compared yeah, to the big the, one. The it's hard to know. It'll be after the fact. We will find but, out. But but it's a real. This isn't like a one in is a that, billion no. possibility. No, no, this no, is no. a realistic it's, chance. It, it's yeah, I think, and I picked that number on purpose because you know why. Yeah, I think so. I think that's right, and I think. You know, one way to think about this it's, is you talk to the people who are trading the claims on the on on. If I wanted to sell my claim on the on my deposits, I right. could, and I think I get like thirty five cents on the dollar. Not much, but some. Right. It's not zero, not two. And that's not atypical. That's not atypical. But if you t talk to the people who buy those, I had a couple tell me we think it's maybe we can maybe get a hundred cents on the dollar. Wow. And but it problem is it's going to take. What did Madoff end up? It was pretty close to a hundred cents, was it wasn't really? it? Yeah, I think they clawed back a lot. Well, so, but this is without clawbacks. Right. So the interesting thing about this is I don't think I mean some people like politicians, people who are embarrassed to have taken Sam's money and can give it back, have given some of it back. It's pretty peanuts that. But there are rules about clawbacks in bankruptcy. Right. You have to demonstrate that when the money was given, uh, that the it was the proceeds of a crime. Also, that it was insolvent. And it's unclear when FTX becomes insolvent. Is it November of last year? Is it June? It certainly wasn't January of last year. They were fine. So anything that went out the door before then, you're not going to be able to claw and back. With, with Madoff, it was pretty easy. There was never, right. you know, the last 20 years, there was no business That's there. Right. Whatever you got, you were getting somebody else's money. That's, so that was easy. This, this is, is a little more Very little different. More and they have not made the argument yet. And tellingly, if it turns out that the money is there. It will be because those a the assets add up to what the, the liabilities. That nobody's really gone systematically through this pile of stuff, an incredible pile of stuff that Sam Bankman-Fried accumulated. It's a hundred and something private investments. You call it the dragon's lair. He threw $5 billion into 300 separate entities. And many of these are giant winners. You know, Some like of the zeros, it's a, but- yeah, It's a VC portfolio. Yeah. And the question is, what's it worth? And I don't know what it's worth. Um, is it enough to close the gap between 8.6 and 7.3? It seems so. There's some other, they owe, they owe some other stuff, but the customer, it'll be interesting to see what the customers get back. So one other thing I have to ask about is you throw some shade at some of the big law firms, Sullivan and Cromwell and others. First, Sullivan and Cromwell was for a while FTX's outside counsel for certain things. Including their dealings with the regulators. Which, which kind of raises questions, how could they be bankruptcy counsel? I don't understand it. Because they're sitting on. Isn't the, that an inherent conflict of interest? They're sitting on the evidence for the trial. So uh, you would have thought, I would have thought that at least people would raise questions about the lawyers for FTX being also the lawyers for the bankruptcy, and also, especially since they're the ones who really twisted Sam's arm to sign the, the bankruptcy documents. Right. And, and, and there was a typo I found in the book. You you wrote that the bankruptcy lawyers are going to generate fees of a billion dollars. That's a typo. What what's that number supposed to be? It's not a typo. It's a billion dollars they're, in lawyer they're, they're fees. They're hundreds, advisor, lawyer and other fees. Real. 
lower and other fees. So this is where we are. It's, we're at several hundred million now. Uh -huh. One of the creditors, big creditor, did an analysis of what, what they were going to charge by the time the dust settles, and they figured out it's going to be about a billion dollars. That's unconscionable. The, the thing that's striking to me is just how uh, insider a game the bankruptcy process is. For a long time now, too. Yeah, but it, it used to be regulated by the SEC. And in, in the 80s, they got they took it out of the SEC uh -huh. and they created this thing called a, a bankruptcy trustee who's in the who's in the Department of Justice, but has no real power except the power to bitch and moan to the right. bankruptcy. Judge. Right. He can petition, but he's got no. And authority. So he did in this case. He said this is outrageous. They shouldn't be the, the Department of Justice guy wrote a long letter saying you should not allow Sullivan and Cromwell to be the. The bankruptcy lawyers, and when they should. So all this isn't Michael Lewis whining at, no, the, no, no. at any. This is basically DOJ saying these are the wrong attorneys. But here. they don't have the power to do anything about it. And uh, and did the SEC back in the day? Yeah, yeah. So huh. they've it's it's just cha it's changed so that it, the power resides with the bankruptcy judge, and the bankruptcy judge is usually a former bankruptcy lawyer, and it just starts to smell like a club. Uh, and what with all the 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 trustee was asking for is there needs to be like an outside examiner to to watch this stuff, and the judge wouldn't even allow that. So this thing is happening essentially inside of a black box, and and uh, and I just find that curious. It just seems like how could that be? How how could it be? So so I have hundreds of questions more for you, but I'm going to just stick to the two most uh, potent ones now. Uh, effective altruism seemed like a big part of, of Sam's persona and his self-identification. Uh, I came away from the book thinking this is a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> I, I, I mean, seriously, they, they talk about, well, the risk from a supernova is one in a billion and an asteroid is one in a million and a pandemic is one in a hundred and AI is one in 30. And these are just BS made up numbers, which... You know, to a math guy, even a middling MIT math guy, should have been like obvious red flags that this is crap. How did they get away fooling so many smart people? Or, or am I overstating this? I said the same thing. I, I mean, I, I, I immediately. <laughs> so, but by the way, if you just sit down for two minutes with a, a pen and paper, the one in a billion on, on the supernova, you could show us something like one in four trillion very, very easily. And I'm sure, it, but it doesn't matter. They're just round, made-up numbers. So in their heads, you got to understand this is a psychological as much of an as an intellectual right. movement, right? It's it's tribal. They're finding solace in each other's company. They're loving having these arguments about this thing. And what would they say? Let me see if I can defend it for just a moment. Um, there's some number that's true, whatever it is. We don't may not know the number, but there's some number that's true. And if any number is true, and you multiply it by an infinite future, you get a big number. Uh, yes and no. I mean, for a guy <laughs> try, who specializes I tried, in I tried. probabilities. I, tr I tried. I tried. I tried. Hey, listen, eventually the universe suffers from heat death, and entropy means that everything dies. Yeah, yeah. So so why I, bother I, doing your homework? I tried. Right. I, I just tried. I, I'll stop now. I didn't try to do much in the way of defending this. I, I, no, I was completely simpatico with you as you as I'm reading and I'm I'm turning but, my nose up, but, and so, then you throw so, the numbers so, out so and me, say this is offer, nonsense. Let me offer another kind okay. of weird defense of them and that it's pretty cool how quickly they got to threats from artificial intelligence. Right. And when that's no, fair. When nobody cared about it. Right. And now everybody and, and a pandemic before COVID. Yeah. That's right. So, so, so I'll they, give them credit for that. Give them some credit for paying attention to things. These things are not unimportant. Once you start to kind of turn mathy about them, it starts to feel a little silly. Yeah. Uh, and especially when you devote your life to these equations, yeah. then it seems to sit like a little just off. But it wasn't just stupid. It was 4.0 stupid. It was, it was, it was, you know what that is? It's sort of like... Sort of like the kid on the softball Weapons team. Weapons grade, stupid. Yeah, it's like the kid on the softball team who's the best student but doesn't know when to steal a base. And it, it is a little of that. It's a different. It's like blind spots to the intelligence is huh. what it felt like. Like really smart people with this big blind spot. L last question. Um, so I've read your whole body of work, some books multiple times, and we, we talked a little bit about Flash Boys, but the thing that kind of stood out to me is wondering – 
regarding the characters in this book, do you find any similarities between the world of crypto and the world of subprime mortgage securitization? Any parallels there? You know, there probably are. That's not what popped into my mind. What popped into my mind when I was working on the book, the nature of the characters and kind of how outrageous it all was and how there were no guardrails was Liar's Poker. I just felt like I'm back in a time, I'm back in a space where your jaw is on the floor because of what's going on and you can't believe this happens in a business. It, that was the feeling about Liar's Poker. Wait, this this is an actual business and people are, strippers are on the floor and all that stuff. And, and then it quickly got very straight laced on the surface. This is, before this is the moment in crypto before it gets straight laced, and and it, it reminded me of that. Different people, you know, they're they're more nerds than jocks, uh -huh. uh, but but still wacky, like just wacky behavior, and the wackiness was kind of joyous. It was like there's the, a, a range of behavior is being tolerated here that's not ordinarily tolerated in commercial and financial life. Right. This was more frat house than trading floor. There. there or, or yes, a nerd frat house, but yes. Huh. Michael, thank you for being so generous with your time. We have been speaking with the one and only Michael Lewis, discussing his brand new book, Going Infinite, The Rise and Fall of a New Tycoon. If you enjoy this podcast, well, be sure and check out any of the previous 500 we've done over the past nine years. You can find those at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube, or Bloomberg.com. Follow me on Twitter at Ritholtz. Follow all the Bloomberg family of podcasts at Podcast. Uh, check out my daily reads at Ritholtz.com. I would be remiss if I did not thank the crack team who helps put these podcasts together each week. My audio engineer is Meredith Frank. Atika Valbron is my project manager. Anna Luke is my producer. Sean Russo is my researcher. I'm Barry Ritholtz. You've been listening to Masters in Business on Bloomberg Radio.